get to the baptism though, I get to kind of round out our sermon series that we've been doing this term called Jesus Unmasked. And through this sermon series, what we've been doing is we've been looking at some of the different characteristics of Jesus so that we might understand kind of about the man that we are called to follow. Tonight is kind of the end to that. And the passage that we'll be reading from tonight will be Matthew 21, verse 12 to 17. And so if you've got your Bibles, whip them out. Matthew 21, verse 12 to 17. It will also be on the screen behind me. It says this, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the, tab- he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never heard from the lips of children and infants, you Lord have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. Big text, a lot of things happening in that text. And so before we go any further, how about we pray? Jesus, I just want to thank you so much for your presence in this room tonight. God, as we stop and as we pause, would we become aware of it? God, would you open our eyes Open our ears to what you are doing here tonight. Would you come and have your way? God, as I speak, would they be your words and not mine? More of you, less of me. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Growing up, a skill that I always kind of wanted to have but never seemed to be gifted with was kind of like drawing and painting. Anyone who's good at drawing or painting? Yeah, First of all, beautiful. There's also probably humble people that haven't got their hands up. I really wanted to be good at art and God just never gifted me in this area and I'm still sad about it. But it's fine because a couple of years ago, Kmart came out with Colour by Numbers. Yes, well done Kmart. I know, Kmart pulling through. And they were cheap. And so a couple of years ago, I headed to Kmart. I bought myself a Colour by Numbers and I was about to live my artistic dreams through this Colour by Numbers. And I bought a really beautiful one. The picture looked so, so nice. And I set myself up. I knew it was going to take a couple of hours. So I set myself up at home. I had like my pots of paint. I had the image that it was meant to look like. And I had the canvas in front of me. And I just got to work. I got to work painting. And pretty early on, I started to realise that the colour pots that they had given me were not the same as what the image that I had seen. And as I continued painting, I got more and more frustrated as the image that I was creating differed more and more from the image that I was sold. And it ended up getting to the point where I, (laughs) I get quite dramatic and I like got up, I chucked the painting on the floor. I was like, I've had enough. And I didn't, I've never done a colour by number again from Kmart. And I didn't, I, I didn't finish the painting. I was so, I know, I'm sorry. I was so angry. I was so frustrated because I had, I'd seen an image. I'd seen an image. And no matter how hard I tried, nothing I do could make that come true. I tried and it just didn't look like what I had been sold. And I don't know about you, but we, well, we all can admit, we live in an imperfect world, right? We live in an imperfect world with imperfect people. And sometimes I get frustrated by that. I get frustrated when I look out at the world and there are things that are happening that I'm like, this just doesn't make sense. This just doesn't make sense. I have an image of how it should look, like the day should look. I have images of how my family should look, of how my friends should look, how maybe your school should look. And we have images of how things should be and we can get frustrated and angry when it doesn't happen the way we wanted to. Am 
Am I the only one? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Well, that's okay. I'll just preach to myself tonight. That's fine. I know I'm not. We get frustrated when things don't happen the way that we want them to. We get frustrated when things don't happen the way that we want them to. And I think actually our frustration and our anger can sometimes be a good thing in a sense because I think when we look at the injustices of the world, when we look at the imperfections of this world and of ourselves and of the people around us, the fact that we get angry and frustrated by it suggests that there must be a better way, right? The fact that we get angry and frustrated by it means that there's something that we're trying to compare it to that is so much better. And what we see in this passage of Scripture is we see Jesus coming along and getting angry, getting frustrated about something because there was an image of how something was meant to look and the reality was so much different. He got angry. He got angry. And in the in midst of the imperfections of this world, here's what I know to be true. We can turn to Jesus, the ultimate grace-filled corrector. Now, everyone repeat after me, grace-filled corrector. I'm quite impressed with you. There's a lot of energy tonight. That's beautiful. Grace-filled corrector. Now, that might not make much sense right now, but hopefully it will in a little bit. I want to focus. I've just got two points tonight. I want to focus firstly on Jesus as a corrector. And then I want to look at Jesus as being someone who is so grace-filled. It's not even funny. Firstly, Jesus as a corrector. Now, according to the dictionary and the reality... A corrector is someone who points out and fixes errors, mistakes, or faults. Someone who points out and then fixes errors, mistakes, or faults. I don't know about you, but when I hear the word corrector, I don't get like warm and fuzzy feelings inside. Oftentimes, when I think about the word corrector, it seems like quite a disciplinary role. And I imagine kind of like a judge sitting up the back on with a wooden table in front of them with the like hammer, gavel thing, whatever it's called, ready to like bang down hard whenever anyone messes up. I have this kind of cold, hard image in my mind of what a corrector is. And oftentimes, I think Correction is something, I tie that to discipline, I tie that to punishment, and I think that it's something that I need to avoid at all costs. So why is it actually a good thing that in this text, Jesus is a corrector? Why is it a good thing that not just in this text, but Jesus is a corrector? Why, why is that a good thing? If it's not a warm and fuzzy feeling that we initially get when we think of it, why is it a good thing that he's a corrector? I wonder whether we actually need to have a better understanding of what it means to receive correction. I wonder whether we need to have a better understanding of what it means to receive correction. Because what if we didn't think of correction as punishment, New Life Youth? What if we didn't think of correction as punishment, but rather a moment for someone to call out something better? What if instead of seeing Jesus as kind of this judge who is distant, ready to just punish and discipline as he sees fit, we see him more acting in this moment as a loving father correcting his children. Now, I just want to acknowledge, and I'm going to lay it on the table. There are people here in this room that when I talk around the idea of a father and correction, that might bring something up for you. Maybe you don't have a great relationship with your earthly father or your earthly mother. And so the idea of this can sit a little bit not great. I want to acknowledge that. That For that, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I think when we read the Bible, what we actually see is a beautiful example of what it looks like to receive loving correction. Receive loving correction. He is the example of what it is. He is the example because here's what I know to be true. A loving parent disciplines or corrects their child because they see something better in them. Correction from a loving parent comes from a place of, oh my goodness, you are not your behaviour right now. And so I'm going to correct that because I see something so much more for you. 
I'm going to correct your behaviour. I'm going to correct your actions because I actually think you can be so much more than what's happening right now. A loving parent disciplines and corrects from a place of love and from a place of calling you higher. And in the temple courts, Jesus is correcting these people. He is correcting these people and He is calling them higher. He is correcting the mistakes that have been made within this temple. Now, a little bit of context. These people in the temple courts that Jesus kind of like overturned the tables of, they were selling and buying sacrifices that they were then going to offer to Jesus, which in and of itself, actually not a bad thing. But Jesus actually makes mention to, which is so cool. Oh my goodness. Jesus makes mention to something that was spoken about centuries prior in Jeremiah. He makes reference to something spoken about centuries, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years prior in the book of Jeremiah, who was a prophet. And I'm going to read that out because I think it provides context to what the heck is happening here. In Jeremiah 7 verse 9 to 11, it says this, Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we are safe, safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? And Jesus like hundreds of years later in the temple courts, is referencing this text. So theologians believe that what Jesus is doing in this moment is not actually calling out the actions of what's happening, but rather the hypocrisy behind it. Jesus is calling out those that we would now call Sunday Christians. Those that come, that do all the right things in church on a Sunday, but then throughout the week, their lives look absolutely the same as everyone else. That is what Jesus is calling out in this moment. That is what Jesus is calling out in this moment. And He clears out the junk. He clears out the mess. And He says, I have created this temple, this place of worship for something so much more than what it is being used for right now. I have created you for so much more than what you are doing right now. And I am angry at what is happening. I am angry because I created it for this image in mind and it currently looks like this. There was a righteous anger and frustration that Jesus was showing in this moment. And so he cleared it out. He cleared out the temple. And just as Jesus cleared out the temple, I believe that there is stuff in our lives that Jesus is wanting to clear out. There is stuff in our hearts, in our minds, in our thoughts, in our actions that Jesus is wanting to clear out and say, that actually is not who you are. I created you for this purpose, like this, and instead you are doing this. I am frustrated and angry because there is so much more to what is happening right now. He can get frustrated and what happens is he then corrects. In Proverbs 3 verse 11 to 12, it says this, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Delights in. It comes from a place of like so much love that we cannot even comprehend it. Jesus wants the best for every single person in this room. Every single person in this room. But the reality is every single person in this room sins, which means we mess up all the time. I mess up all the time, all the time. And Jesus can come alongside me and he go, Courtney, when you said that thing, do we maybe want to apologise for it? Courtney, there's this, there's this insecurity stuff that we need to work on right now. I'm, I'm gonna, I want to help you clear out the junk so that you can step more into who I've created you to be. Maybe for you, it's, oh my, hey, I don't know, Andrew, we're going to work on this identity stuff. Tara, we're going to work on this friendship. We're going to clear out some of this junk because I have created you for a plan and for a purpose and this junk is getting in the way. That happens only through correction. It happens through Jesus gently calling our stuff out in us that is not like he initially intended, that is not like he initially intended. 
And we need to allow him sometimes to correct us. We need to allow him to speak truth into different circumstances. So Jesus is a corrector. He corrects things. He makes things right. He clears out junk. But then you know what he is also? He is so full of grace, it's not even funny. So full of grace. We talk about grace often here at New Life Youth. And I wonder how many, money? I wonder how many of us actually know what grace means. See, grace is simply God's unmerited favour and love freely given to humanity. Unmerited, which means that we don't deserve it. Freely given, which means we've done nothing to deserve it. Like absolutely, like we cannot earn it. It's unmerited and freely given to all. God's grace is freely given to all. And in this story, it's so, the juxtaposition of this moment is so wild. In this story, you see him like literally clearing out the junk, clearing out the temple. And the next sentence in verse 14 is like the most beautiful act of grace and mercy. It says this, the blind and the lame came, the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. He healed them. The blind, this is significant because the blind and the lame would not have been allowed to enter the temple. And here he at, here's Jesus clearing out the temple. And then those that other people looked over, those that were unseen, those that were cast out, Jesus welcomes and doesn't just welcome, but he heals them. And then moments later, he defends the children. The chief priests come to him after hearing the children calling out, Hosanna, son of David. And Jesus defends the children. He defends those that could not defend themselves. He extends grace and mercy and healing and love to those that others had cast out. And what he's saying in this moment is all are welcome in my presence and in my temple. All are welcome. My grace is offered for all, not just for those that look like they have their stuff together, but for every single person. Every single person is welcome in my house. Every single person is welcome in my presence, not because of anything they did to deserve it, but simply because I made them, I chose them, I love them, and I will extend grace to them. That is what's happening in this moment. It is radical grace that is going on. And there is literally nothing like this. This is not just a moment in 2,000 years ago that Jesus does this, that he extends radical grace, that kind of radical grace is on offer for every single person in this room. There is literally not a single, single thing that you could do that would like separate you from the grace that Jesus has on offer for you. Romans 5 verse 8 says this, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The creator, the creator of the universe, the one who hung the stars, sent his one and only son, like no other, the one and only son, to live a life on earth for 33 years and live a radical life of utmost perfection, a life that we could not live, a life where he welcomed sinners, where he sat with sinners, where he spoke truth and he spoke love, where he rode in on a donkey and then washed his disciples' feet, where he spoke truth and where he loved those so radically. For 33 years, he did this. He did not sin once. He lived a perfect life. And then he was put on a cross after being accused of something that he did not do to die a death that we deserve to die because of our sin, because of our shame. And he hung there on the cross and he died to be resurrected three days later just so that we might know that we are loved, that we are accepted, that we are called into relationship with him. Every single thing that God has done is so that we might know that we are called for relationship. Literally everything. He loves you so much so much. And sometimes that's going to look like correction. Sometimes that's going to look like calling things out that you don't want to be called out. And other times it's going to look more like open arms being like, just come here for a big hug. Jesus loves you so much. And I think so often we miss it. We miss it. 
And we live in an imperfect world with imperfect people. I'm imperfect, you're, we're all imperfect. And Jesus comes to show us, to correct us, to show grace to us, to love us, that even in the midst of the imperfect, imperfection that is our world, there is a better way. Even in the midst of this imperfect world, there is one who is perfect, and that is Jesus. And when we fall short, when we mess up, He comes along and He helps clear out our junk. He gets in the mess. He overturns tables so that we might know that we are loved. So that we might know that we are loved.